The videographer of today is Myra Siegel. Uh, I'm here to interview Mr. Fred Ullman, who is a survivor of the Holocaust. We're making this video under the auspices of the Montreal Holocaust Memorial Center. The purpose of this interview is to add to the oral history of the Holocaust. Good afternoon, Mr. Ullman. For the record, would you um, state your name, please? My name is Fred Ullman. Officially, I'm Frederick Ullman, Frederick Charles Ullman, Charles being the name of my late father. Mm -hmm. Originally, I was Miroslav Ullman. I went to school in Zagreb, Yugoslavia, under this name. Mm -hmm. And um, you were born in Zagreb? I was born in Zagreb, April. Second, nineteen thirteen. And um, when you, the language that you um, used at home was my language at home was Croatian and German. The family spoke German at home, as well as Yugoslav. Mm -hmm. And you went to um, school in Zagreb. I went to school in Zagreb. The language was, of course, Croatian. In the high school, we learned as well French and English. French, I'm sorry, French and German. English was voluntary, and I learned a few months the English school. It was, uh, did you go to a Jewish school? I did not go to a Jewish school. I see. You were involved in youth groups? I was involved in the sports club Maccabi for quite a few years. I also attended the second Maccabiya in uh, what was then Palestine. That was in? In 1935. Thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your, your father and his background. What was his name? My father's name was Dragutin, Charles in English. He was a merchant. He started his own business around 1910. It was a retail business. After the First World War, he switched from being a retailer to being a wholesaler and uh, he supplied retailers in the new country of Yugoslavia, which was formed after the destruction of Austria-Hungary. The merchants bought either directly or they bought through salesmen. We had several salesmen who went to different areas of Yugoslavia twice a year. They had samples which they took in, in their car and went from, from city to city to a village to, to see the various customers. Um, I understand therefore that the family was fairly prosperous. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Was your home very religious? The home was not really religious. My maternal grandfather was quite religious, and uh, I remember that we always had Passover either in our house, where the family gathered, and we had a traditional seder. Uh, tell me a little about your mother. Of course, we also celebrated the high holidays. So it is you observe the rituals. To, we didn't go to school on the other holidays. There was a rabbi who was a teacher of religion who came to our high school classes. There was one or two hours a week when he was teaching religion, history, reading of Hebrew. 
at those times, the Catholic students had in a different classroom their own religious teacher. As far as you're concerned, as far as Zagreb was concerned, when did the war start? The war started April 6, 1941. You wanted to know if I was aware of what was going on in Europe. I was quite aware through newspapers and radio broadcasts. And we were, of course, all the time listening to news from Germany before the war and particularly after the start of the war. We were aware of what was going on in Poland, but without details. We knew about that killing of that official, German official at the embassy in Paris for example, and... Uh, you were not aware, though, of the extent of what was happening in concentration camps in Poland? We didn't know that, that, right. that they existed. We knew about Dachau, where one of my relatives was interned for a while, but he was lucky that he could get out from there, and ultimately he ended up in the United States. Then tell me about what happened as soon as the war started. April the 6th, 1941, Germany attacked Yugoslavia. Well, it didn't start like that. It started, there was pressure by the Nazi government on the Yugoslav government to join the Axis. And there was resistance to it, but they did have a couple of laws. One law was a numerous clauses in the universities, and another one was that Jews were not allowed to be in the business of manufacturing and distribution of food. But nobody was ever stopped going to university or dealing in food because there was no time for the implementation of these laws. That was probably beginning of 1941, and three months later the Germans were in. Right behind the retreating Yugoslavian army came the Germans on their motorcycles, tanks, trucks. And then what happened in Zagreb? Well, it started, I could say, quite fast. We, <clears throat> we had to get Jewish identity cards for which we had to pay. We had uh, we had to get signs that we were Jews. We or had the, to wear them. Or the badges badges below the shoulders in front and in the back. Later they were sub substituted by some metal signs for which we had to pay. The Jewish community was intimidated, people were arrested. The newspapers were full of articles how the how bad the Jews were for the population as well as the Serbs. You had headlines in the newspapers, Jews and Serbs did this, did that. Well Zagreb was in Croatia. It was in Croatia, but we had a we had not only a Jewish minority, if you wish. We had a Serb minority who lived for a long, long time there. There were, there were residents there, they had their businesses there, their professions. And everything was against the Serbs and the Jews and the communists. Uh, were there, was there any relocation of any of the um, Jews in Zagreb? 
Oh yes, there was. There was a main street called Ilitsa. Whatever was north of the, of that main street, that was supposed to be non-Jewish. And all Jews who lived north of that street had to move away. So they moved south of that street. And I had some friends who actually had to move. We never did because we were south of that line. And what also affected me very much, friends of ours who relocated to the south part of the city were near, uh, near a place where there was an annual fair. And they noticed that there were some Jews behind a fence. There was a fence right behind the sidewalk. And that was the fair, fairground. And when we heard about that, that these Jews were in, in the grounds of the fair, we immediately went to see who these Jews were. And we found among them relatives from smaller towns in Croatia who were rounded up and brought into the fairground. At that time, our impression was that these people were going to be taken somewhere to do some work. Let me come back to you and your own experiences. You said you stayed in um, Trieste for, um, for 13 months. Yes. And then what happened? We were in constant contact with the Italian Tourist Bureau, CHIT, trying to get a boat to Uruguay. If we get a boat, we could get the transit visas, we could get further west. Well, we finally arranged and we could get the, we, we all got the transit visas and we ended up in Barcelona. That was in? That was in 1943. We were in Spain again telling the Spaniards we are just waiting to get the boat. While we are also working to get a real entry visa to Uruguay. Although we would have preferred to go to Canada. We heard that a friend and relative of ours was in Canada. So we sent him a cable, but we never got an answer. A few months later, a friend of ours with his family arrived by plane from Rome in Barcelona and he did the same thing. He sent a cable to the common friend in Canada. He was lucky, he got an answer. The answer was, I'll try to get you to Canada. So. We asked for the same thing, and he was successful, and he finally got us the visas to come to Canada. Was it that easy to get visas to come to Canada in those days? It was impossible to get, to get a visa. We were one of the very, very few who arrived during the war. Don't forget that was, that was during the war. We arrived in, in Philadelphia, April the 6th, 1944. Um, which boat did you come over on? We came on, the, on a small boat, Serpa Pinto. In Philadelphia we stayed a few, uh, a short time. We traveled by train to New York, 
I'm talking of my brother, my sister-in-law, and myself. We were in New York, where we had relatives, originally from Austria, whom we met there. We stayed in New York about two months and proceeded to Montreal afterwards, again by train. We arrived in Montreal June 18, 1944. And you've been here ever since? Ever since. What was your reception in Montreal like? Well, I must tell you that on our boat we had company. The Jewish community in Montreal and Toronto were successful in obtaining a number of visas for temporary permits to Canada for the time of the war to come to Canada. These were all Jews who fled to Spain and to Portugal. And we were on the boat with them. They were probably treated and, and uh, received by the Jewish community. But we came alone. So nobody was waiting for us. We didn't have anybody. You came like tourists. We came alone. But we had, we had relatives. I should say, I should say, there was a lady who was a second cousin of my mother's and her husband, who was a good friend of ours. And they were the ones who brought us the visas and they helped us here. We didn't know the language. We knew, we knew French, but that was a big advantage. 